bed frame securely mounted to the trailer. We got the saw head on the rails and everything just ready to go. Now what they want you to do to make sure your saw head and everything is level is go ahead and raise it up to a specific height or any kind of height that you want. And then go ahead and use your rule. All the way over here by the saw guide, you measure to the top of your head block. And then what you do is you measure all the way over here by the other guy, saw guide and see how close they are to being exactly the same dimension. There's an adjustment back here on the back side. It's got a lifting yoke that has an adjusting rod on it. And you adjust that lifting yoke until you get your saw head reading perfectly the same height from that fixed saw guide over here to your adjustable saw guide. That way you know that the blade is going to be perfectly horizontal or level going through your logs. And you can't stress enough the importance of having this thing perfectly level. Uh, and also making sure your joints where the, the bed frames join together, make sure they're absolutely perfectly flush. I had to do just a little bit of finagling back and forth and get those knocked in place uh, just perfectly. Now of course in all the instructions it says to go through and grease everything that's greasable and it'll actually list greasing the main bearings to the wheels unless they're permanently lubricated and as you can see this one here is not a greasable bearing it is a permanently lubricated bearing uh, and it looks like it's fairly easily replaceable because you know there's only so many hours of operations on a permanently greased bearing and it's going to have to be replaced whereas a greasable bearing I think has a greater a greater life expectancy but you have to maintain in a regimen of, of continual grease to make those bearings last. This one here also I think some of the earlier ones didn't have the micro switches that shut the system down in the event you open up the, the door and this one here actually has a, a safety switch on this door and on that door over there as well as they've got a safety catch on the latch which is a, well it's a safety latch I guess. It's got a little little fella in there that you've either got to depress or you've got to push up or pull down in order to get our little clips to open up. There wasn't any specific reference to that. It probably shouldn't have needed it, but I actually ruined mine because I couldn't figure out what was going on. I'd reach around there and it wouldn't open, and I actually pried it open with my finger, and I broke that little latch right there, the little safety catch to the latch. So I wasn't real happy about that, but it's not a big deal. If I have to, I'll change this latch. Now I'm going to assume that without the safety catch on the latch, it's probably with vibration going to continually just bounce loose. So I will have to come up with a way to secure those permanently while it's in operation. So that was my bad. I should have been a little more careful with that. One of the things that might be interesting to point out, uh, you notice how we've got a notch here at an angle. You have to make sure that you get the right one on the right side and the left one on the left side. If not, this obviously is reversed. And then of course your cable is going to want to grind right onto this right here instead of fitting through that angled opening down to your little pulley here to lift the carriage. I put mine together backwards the first time. That was again my own lack of understanding. Probably had I read the manual to a greater extent I probably could have figured that out easier. This may, a, may be a newer version right here whenever you pull the, the throttle it's got a little latch here that actually releases. Watch this crimp. See how it crimps or releases the crimp whenever you pull the there, there it crimps right there to stop the flow when you turn loose the throttle. When you pull the throttle, it pulls it back and releases the crimp and allows the, the liquid to flow. So you only have to adjust your little knob up here to get the correct drippage that you want, you know, onto your blade. So that's really interesting. I think the older models didn't have that, but I'm not certain for that at all. Now I opted for the uh, 13 horse, I believe it is, battery start system because I quite frankly don't really feel the need to crank start a 13 horsepower motor in the middle of the winter. Uh, it has, it comes with an AGM battery, a 12 volt AGM battery, which uh, looks to be a, a pretty fair quality. I don't know, I'm not familiar with the brand, but it's a 310, I think, cold cranking amp battery, which should be adequate to send this Briggs uh, flying. And here's your yoke I referred to before. It was a little unclear. It was a little, a little difficult to figure out exactly what they were talking about when they were talking about the yoke and all that stuff and the pictures that they give wasn't what I would consider stellar uh, for people that are unfamiliar with the machine the first time assembling. So once you figure out exactly what they're talking about when it comes to leveling your blade, your saw blade to your bunks down there, you'll realize how quickly and easily you can get that adjusted. A simple change that I made, the, uh, the, the way they have this rigged up for the water trigger as well as the throttle connection into your throttle lever right here was not satisfactory to me. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think both of them had to hook on a single point. I didn't like that, so I had to re-drill and put in a quarter inch 
a quarter inch bolt and then redrill the openings where they fit the quarter inch and then made the two separate to where they pulled directly right out of the the sheath uh, this here's a cable this here's a hard wire so by changing it the way I did I'm pulling from two different areas and that makes them draw much more evenly and I think easier in the long run to maintain the life of the cable and also the wire from flex for flexibility another issue I had was was the, with the emergency stop the uh, directions that was in my particular book and it said that your emergency stop uh, may vary you know from the picture well mine obviously did and I ended up having to disassemble that switch whether it was correct or not I ended up having to disassemble it and then reassemble it in position and it was a little more difficult it was a little more difficult to assemble in a manner in which it would operate correctly than I thought it should be uh, there should have been in my estimation either specific directions on how to disassemble and reassemble this exact switch or it should have been a switch that didn't require disassembly. Again, that could be my shortcomings in not fully understanding the directions that they were saying. But point being made is it's a different switch than what's shown in the directions. Now, as far as securing the, the saw head to the bed frame, if I, if I read the direction or interpreted the instructions correctly, I think one of these bolts here down the side rail is supposed to be left out, like right in front of the, uh, the axle and you're supposed to be able to bolt a long bolt all the way through this angle right here and then put a nut and everything on it down inside there. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the position that suits me for travel and I'm going to drill my own separate hole and I'm going to make a wedged washer that will square this up so where whenever I draw that in there the wedged washer will hold everything perfectly square and tight and not put any pressure on anything sideways that might give a have a tendency to work loose over the course of a you know 30 40 50 mile ride so that's one change I'm going to make there too of course I'm not saying I interpreted the instructions exactly correct either because it too has a less than adequate picture in what I was looking at to describe that so we'll do something even if it's wrong I guess I might ought to clarify I'm not really giving a review I'm not really picking on the machine I'm not really doing anything other than telling you the little things that I found because of either my shortcomings or their shortcomings as far as the instruction manual is concerned. Common sense tells you if these two are not perfectly in alignment, the blade is going to want to just run right off of it. But it gives you a specific procedure on how to tighten this up and get it to where the bottom of the gullet is actually sticking out in front of your drive wheel. So uh, one's going to be a drive wheel, that one over there, this is going to be the idler. Uh, because obviously it's being driven by the drive wheel and the force of the blade. So once you get the blade tension and tracked correct, you can rotate it multiple times and make sure that the blade does not want to walk off. Another thing about your blade guides right here, there are specific dimensions or specific clearances that you have to maintain with your guides. I forgot exactly what those dimensions are, but they're outlined specifically in the book. And they're simply adjusted by set screws on the sides right here and back there. You have to have a certain distance between the back of the blade and the back roller and also the top and the bottom guides on both the adjustable guide and the fixed guide over there. Right now you can see I do not have the blade tension. I've got it because it's morning. I've left it set untensioned all night so I'm going to have to retension the blade. Once your drive wheel and idler wheel comes in full contact with the blade, it's a little ambiguous as to when you start counting the five revolutions of tightness. but. I just am going to go with in full contact and a little bit snug, then add five complete rotations. Again, this is a learning experience for me, just as much as it is for you. And I'm certain there are many, many other videos out there of other guys that have, that have installed the, or assembled these and have put them to work that probably does a much more comprehensive and much more knowledgeable startup procedure or adjustment procedure. I'm kind of going by the seat of my pants, you know what I mean? But I'm trying to pass on to you the the shortcomings and, and the, the good points as well as the shortcomings that I found. So far the good things by far outweigh you know the shortcomings. And again too you have to make the decision as to whether you want to build your own trailer or use the factory trailer. There's definitely some pros and cons both directions. My issue with building my trailer the way that I built it obviously is the height. It's going to be a little bit high but I'm working on how to get the elevation where I need it to be convenient for loading logs you know, onto it. Doesn't matter a whole lot because I've got a skid loader and I've also got forks on a, on a couple of tractors. So it's not a big problem for me. But if you have to roll them up ramps by yourself uh, or you have a 
a log loading, a winch, things like that, then the height of your trailer is definitely going to make a big difference. But they're definitely, uh, definitely bad points to building your own trailer, but there's 1,400 and some good points too. If you've got the free material laying around, if you have to buy the material, it's going to be a little bit tough to justify. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and tighten this thing up and uh, put a little gas in this thing and see if it's going to want to fire up. Of course, close everything because remember we've got the safety uh, micro switches up here where it will not hit a lick if the uh, doors are open. Now, I don't know if the engine will still turn over or if it completely kills the ignition circuit. I have yet to determine that, but it will not start with the doors open because of these micro switches. Half, one, half. There's my five rotations right there. And it's looking good. You got to remember also to raise this lid here. Uh, you've got to disassemble the, the adjustable guide slide in order to raise it. That's nothing more than a, a thumb screw removal over here on this side. This is your alignment bolt on this side right here. That's what's responsible for going in and putting pressure on the shaft that houses this uh, idler pulley and cocks the idler pulley this way or that way to get the blade to track correctly. And this of course is the uh, tensioning, the tensioning lever that I was at adjusting and this is your adjustable guide it raises up slides out you can see the notches and everything and this here's your tracking bolt or tracking adjustment on the uh, on the non-operator side or the po opposing side this so this also comes with convenient carriage stops on either end two of them on the other end exactly like this and then this one on this side and the opposing side over here has got a very convenient lock so whenever you're carriage comes back or your saw head comes back you can actually lock the carriage assembly or the saw head to it. Now that's not something that you want to rely on to transport it with by any stretch of the imagination. I think I pointed out before in a prior video that this has a 310 or 330 cold cranking amp uh, glass mat battery inside your self-contained sealed battery. It's more than adequate I'm sure to give a 13 and a half horse Briggs what it needs to uh, to fire up. It looks like gas is off in this position here, so this should be the gas turned on. It uh, looks like this is going to be the choke position right here. And of course the throttle position is over here on the handle. So I'm going to leave it about a quarter to a third throttle. We're going to see what's going to happen here. Full of gas, full of oil, everything is uh, ready to go. I'm assuming it's got to prime the carburetor and all that stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and leave. Whoops, wait a minute. I turned the gas back off. Gas is this away. Oh, wait a minute. No, I didn't. This is full choke and this is gas on. I think my emergency stop, whenever I reassembled my emergency stop, I think I had my emergency stop in the, stop, in the uh, open position. This might make a little bit of a difference. let it warm up a little bit. I take all credit for uh, overlooking the emergency stop being pushed. I think had I not had that emergency stop in the wrong position, I think it would have fired off just like that. With the tires off, Resting just a little bit on one side because I want a slight incline, uh, the center part of the spring. I'm able to get it uh, perfectly horizontal all the way across. <clears throat> and perfectly level lengthwise. And the working height is definitely in the area in which I would envision.
nails, we get somebody wanting to come in the road whenever we get something crossways at it. I can tell you one thing, this is entirely different than a circular sawmill. Even rotating these logs, dogging them especially, man, this is terrible. Well, I shouldn't say terrible, it's something I'm not used to. Okay, I noticed on the very first cut, I forgot about the uh, tensioning on the saw head. So as I was actually pushing that through, I came out one inch lower, unbeknownst to me, than I was when I went in. So that first cut has got a bit of a bow in it. So I have to resaw that. Uh, but I went ahead and adjusted that little tension adjustment up on top. Now the saw head should, with the vibration, stay intact, or say at that setting. We're gonna see. Like I say, this is just, um, just a trial run experiment. Yeah, I got a lot of these cedar logs laying around, so it doesn't really matter if I mess them up. But one thing that I did find out uh, it was very apparent that a shorter person like myself, uh, the height is a little bit of a problem on turning the crank, you know, uh, adjusting the height of the saw head. But I'll solve that by the time we saw a couple more logs, uh, and it worked out really quite well. I'll tell you one thing though, my son's a little bit taller than I am, and so is my son-in-law. It's actually the perfect height for those guys. Tell you another thing too, I'm not real uh, fun of the way you gotta clamp these, uh, these logs in there. This is so different than the circle mills that I grew up with. Uh, that, uh, but this something you just gotta deal with. I'm sure once I get on top of the learning curve, it'll probably be a whole heck of a lot easier. But uh, for now, it, it is definitely aggravating. Too. Now, as I proved right here, setting that can hook right there on the side, you're going to see how important it is to always be aware of your surroundings. I didn't even see or recognize that I'd rested that camp hook alongside the track until I was pushing through the next cut and I actually saw it fall down whenever the roller came in contact with it. So that's uh, that kind of reminded me of a lesson that I've learned a long time ago. I just kind of temporarily forgot. Now the whole thing about uh, playing with it, you know, and kind of getting familiar with it, is finding out all the little adjustments and stuff you haven't got quite right. Now, if you notice right there, you hear the uh, the wind, the the crank popping and cracking. I still don't have the tension correct on that that elevation mechanism. You're supposed to oil it every time you use it, and I did, of course, but uh, I still have the tension too tight. So I've got to uh, fiddle with that and get that just to the point where it'll hold in place, but not be so aggravatingly difficult to uh, to turn the crank to change that elevation up or down. But I get that solved too. Oh, and by the way, if you want to see the missus finish up her log, you'll either have to skip to the end or watch it all the way to the end to, uh, to see her finishing it up.
I can tell you one thing, after sawing just one log, I can tell you there's going to be a learning curve to, um, to all of the nuances. As far as sawing is concerned, this thing really is doing a fine job. Of course, everything is brand new. Uh, everything seems to be square. The boards are just absolutely incredible coming off of there. Now, I'm just tickled to death with it so far. Now, this is cedar that I cut about three years ago, so it's been sitting in the log pile for about three years. And there's still a percentage of moisture in it. I would say probably a pretty high percentage of moisture. But the reason I was taking such thick slabs at the top is to minimize the number of passes through the bark and through that sapwood with the blade because there's grit and everything in them. It's going to just eat them blades up pretty quickly. So you may as well make a nice thick sawmill slab. You can go ahead and, and saw with the buzz saw, burn it in the, in the stove, whatever, use it for kindling, whatever, instead of making all those multiple passes and tearing your blade up and all that. That's my own thought. Another thought too, on a circular mill, we always law, uh, saw from the big end, from the butt cut, but I can see the benefits on this guy here of sawing from the small end because you have the benefit of being more accurate in making your estimation for the height of the first cut for the slab instead of having to measure up from the, from the knee or from the bunk up about whatever and then set your scale at that number. You've got it right up there on that end. You can eyeball it. You can set it. You can go. That's my own two cents worth. My dad's probably roll, rolling over in his grave hearing me say that because he insisted always cut from the butt in first on, on the old circular mills. But, you know, I think nowadays it's just going to be whatever works out easiest. The dogs are, are adequate, but I'm not real happy. Of course, I'm used to the to the regular regular dogs on a circular sawmill, so I'm sure I'll get used to this in time. Now, those are just thoughts off the top of my head. This is the first run of this thing. I'm really satisfied with the, with the homemade trailer. It's down fairly close to the height that I can work it. There's a little concession that I have to make, like I say, all the time. Thanks for coming along and uh, sharing the tribulations, the trials and tribulations. This was a, this was a fun build from start to finish. I learned a lot about the uh, the Frontier line. And I got to give a shout out to a young fellow named Andrew. Andrew was my phone contact at, uh, at Frontier Mills or Norwood uh, Industries. And he did a remarkable job, helped me through everything. And I told him I was going to give him a shout out whenever I did this video. And so Andrew, here you are, dude. I really am happy with your product. And uh, I thought I made some constructive criticism about some of the things in the manual. Uh, you probably heard it all before. And there's people a lot smarter than me to give you much better critique, I guarantee you. But all in all, dollar for dollar, I'm really tickled to death with this thing so far. You know what? This is Trackman 44, and I'm out of here, guys. Now, unfortunately, I didn't get the missus to do the very first log, but by golly, I got her to do the second one. So here she is, finishing it up. This is Tractor Man 44 and the business, and we're both out of here.